I am Bruce Jackson. Our scripture today is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my lip, my mouth with it, and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Bruce. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church. We are in a worship series entitled Lifelong Learners, helping us all be reminded that Following Jesus is a lifetime task, and the first week we talked about invite, that someone invited us to this journey of following Jesus, and of course we invite others, and we reaffirmed our baptismal vows that day. Last week we talked about inquire, how our faith grows most when we get to ask questions about our faith, and the best place to do that is in small groups. And today we talk about inspire, worship. Let us pray together. Almighty God, the weather unsettles us a bit, but we have come for the sacred purpose of meeting you. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, meet us in this hour and speak to our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So we're talking about worship and the snowblowers going on outside, and I realize there's this phrase about preaching to the choir, and you get a sense where it's almost literally true in this hour. Um, And I'm preaching to people who are here in the midst of snow, encouraging people to attend upon the spiritual discipline of worship. Um, It seems a bit redundant, and yet here we go. Don't we all need to be inspired? right? Whether it's an artist with a blank canvas in front of us, a student who has a paper due and the word processor screen is just blank and you don't know where to start. Sometimes we need inspiration in in relationship to our creativity. Sometimes we need inspiration in the sense of motivation. How do I keep going when, you know, I'm just hoping this month that the money doesn't run out before the days of the month run out and We're just trying to make it from day to day. We all need inspiration. And if we're true to ourselves, isn't that why we come on a Sunday morning? To be inspired? And so the second leg of our, or the third leg of our lifelong learners is what we call inspire. We lift up and worship the ways that God inspires us through our life and the lives of those around us because that makes space for the Spirit to persuade us to pursue a relationship with God. We come to worship to be inspired. Think about that. It's a little bit different from many of the the normal ways we think about why we should worship. The first thing that comes to my mind is, well, we ought to. When you come to the Ten Commandments, there's that, that commandment, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. And Jesus In Luke chapter 4, when he came to present his first sermon to his hometown crowd in Nazareth, 
there's this little underrated phrase I think that needs to be lifted up these days. Jesus went to the synagogue, and the phrase is, as was his custom. It was something that he did on a regular basis. Does the Son of God need to worship? Or did Jesus do that to remind us that it, this is one of the essential spiritual disciplines for any Christian to attend upon the worship of God? We know we ought to. And yet, that only gets us so far. Worship is supposed to be something we love doing because it's about a loving relationship between ourselves and God. First thing we need to get clear is who are the players in worship? Because there's a tendency, because we kind of stand up here and the choir's on a choir loft, we're kind of lifted up so you can see what's going on up here. There's a misunderstanding among many people that we're the participants and you are the audience. In fact, the audience in worship is no one less than God. When we come into worship and we sing, we sing words like joyful, joyful, we adore thee, we love you, God. That's why we sing. It's an artful way to express our adoration and our love for God, and it's something we do over and over I know one of the critiques of contemporary worship these days is, oh, they sing that verse over and over and over. There's another guy who was contemporary in his own day named George Friedrich Handel who wrote this piece called Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> it goes on and on over and over because when you say I love you, how many of us in a relationship, either dating or married, you know, you want to hear I love you more than once. And so we say that or we sing that to God over and over. God is the audience who is listening to everything that we say and everything that we sing. The goal in the midst of this, and that's why some of it sometimes feels repetitious, the goal in worship is transcendence. That place where you're not thinking, oh, I've got a pot roast in the oven, or I've got to meet somebody for lunch, or I've got homework that hasn't been done and I need to get at it right as soon as I get home. When you're in that transcendent moment, it's, it's like that moment I think most of us are familiar with. There's a, oh, finally, the pastor picked a hymn that I know, you know. <laughs> and it's a hymn that I know and that I love and evokes memories and I know the tune and I know the lyrics and I just close my eyes and... You know that moment, right? You're in the spirit of God, in God's presence. That's what inspires us. Not that I'm here because I ought to, but I'm here because I'm lifted up in the very presence of God, and it's God is saying, I love you, my child, and I'm singing, and I'm saying, I love you to God. Everybody needs inspiration, and that is also true of the prophet Isaiah. The text begins with this, in the year that King Uzziah died, and that doesn't mean anything to you and me, but it's like you know, when you had that president that you loved, and all of a sudden that president isn't in office anymore, and now we've got, eh, or whatever. Uzziah was one of those kings that was great. And then things just went south as soon as he died. In the year that King Uzziah died, Judah found itself about to go to war with Syria, and Syria makes an alliance with, of all people, Israel. Judah, remember this, the southern kingdom, Israel, the northern kingdom? They're cousins, and they're about to go to war with one another. So what does Judah do? Do they return back to God and start living in holy ways? No, they make an alliance with Assyria. And Isaiah is the prophet. He's the one, you know, who's supposed to speak to kings and to speak to the people. And by the way, a reminder, prophecy is not about future telling. It's telling about what God is saying about this situation. And Isaiah finds himself in the year that King Uzziah died. He's disillusioned. And he probably catches himself saying, you know, somebody ought to speak to this king. Okay, here's, here's a warning, friends. Whenever you find yourself saying, someone ought to, you know, some of you are getting this. You know where it's going. Whenever you find yourself saying, someone ought to, well, notice who's noticed the issue that's before us. It's you. And you may be the only one that's noticed the issue. Everybody else seems to be fine with it. So guess whose responsibility it is to do something about it? It's you. 
A friend of mine was serving a, a rather nice congregation, and everything was, was fine that Sunday, he told me. The worship experience seemed to be inspirational for him and for many other people. Everybody was all smiles as he was shaking hands, and this one woman came through the line shaking hands with the pastor, and she looked down at the steps, and she said, I wish someone would sweep the leaves off these steps. He said, I came this close, this close to just saying, wait here just a minute, walking down the hall, getting a broom and handing it to her. But we've all been guilty of that, right? Somebody ought to. Now, you know and I know what a mess this world is in. You can look at it from all different perspectives, poverty, people's values, however you want to look at it. And if you find yourself saying, somebody ought to, well, notice what happens to Isaiah when he says somebody ought to, and he goes into the temple. And for those of you who've never really thought about it, we brought an image of, of the outer court. This is the outer court of the temple is what you're seeing in front of you. This is, this is a model, actually, of Herod's temple, but it would have been the same general feel of the temple of Solomon that Isaiah would have walked into. And you notice the big central section. And in the very back section of, of that room is called the Holy of Holies. Now, I know you and I talk about this space, this sanctuary, as being the house of God. But remember for Judah, this is Jerusalem. There is only one temple. And in the Holy of Holies, that's where they understood God was in a very real sense. Because when you pulled back the curtain and went into the Holy of Holies, and of course a priest could go back there one day out of the year, you saw this. Many of us remember Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, this is what is called the Ark of the Covenant. And this is another artist's rendering of what it must have looked like. A box that was covered in gold, and inside the tradition was, this is where the tablets of the Ten Commandments that Moses had received, they were contained in this box. There were handles on it so that they carried it throughout the wilderness. And when they settled in Jerusalem and built the temple, they put the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies. This was also called the throne of God because this is where God was. And you notice those wing characters on the, on the top, those are called seraphs, or the plural is actually seraphim if you've ever read that in the Bible. And those are the creatures that fly from the throne of God to Isaiah in his, what do we call it? A vision? He goes into the temple and he has some kind of vision of God. And the, the description just talks about all the different images and it says the hem of God's robe fills the temple. Now that's not that God has a really big coat, you know, that only God could wear. It's a way of saying God's presence just filled the room. And he says the pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called and the house was filled with smoke. The ground, he says, is shaking underneath me like an earthquake. And the room is filled with smoke. That was another symbol of God's presence. You know, in, in other traditions, they will carry incense into worship because smoke has always been a, a symbol of God's presence. Remember the wilderness? There was the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of smoke during the day that they followed. He's saying, the floor is shaking and God is all around me. Do you understand what he's going through? And what's his response? Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. The absolute presence and the absolute holiness of God makes Isaiah all the more aware of his own unholiness. I don't know about you, but I, I, I get that a lot when I experience God's presence. Other people tell me, no, it's always warm and, and loving and... and but sometimes I am made very much aware of God's purity and holiness and my own soul and my own reflection in light of that. It's just impure and corrupt. And I want to respond like Isaiah, woe is me. Who am I to do anything for God or represent God when I am so impure? And that's when the seraph reaches down to to the altar and pulls out a coal, a burning coal, and touches his mouth. There, now that that has touched your mouth, 
your guilt and your sin are taken away. Notice how painful that is. Because when we're dealing with our sinfulness, it's not a comfortable feeling. It takes drastic measures to blot our sin out. It's like cauterizing a wound, Isaiah says. And he felt that. And that seemed to be enough. As painful as it was, that seemed to be enough so that he felt forgiven by the Almighty God. And then there's God's next move. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Remember, as God speaks, the whole floor is shaking. What do you think Isaiah's going to say? Here am I. Send me. God, you and I both know, I'm not worthy for this, but I'm trusting you're going to go with me, so here I am. When was the last time you experienced God anything like that? Where you felt God's presence in an unmistakable way? Do we ever underestimate what Sunday morning is about? When you come on a Sunday morning, do you really expect to encounter God? I love that phrase we use sometimes, you know, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Because it's acknowledging, it's a metaphor, acknowledging there's an issue that's right in front of all of us, but none of us really want to go there because it's a tough issue. Let's try another phrase. Let's talk about the God in the room. A little bit bigger than an elephant. And that's here. Right here right now. Our beloved, loving God is in the room. And in a few moments, we're going to come to God's table. And what we believe about Holy Communion is Jesus Christ himself is the host. By the power of the Holy Spirit, not that these elements are unique other than they represent for us that Christ is here. And I want to invite you to think about this very graphic image as it happens as you take communion this morning, as you swallow the bread, as you feel that that cold grape juice hit your belly, probably getting a little hungry right before lunchtime, as you feel that, feel God inside you. And it's there not because you're good enough, we all know we're not worthy, but it's there because God has a job to do to fix this broken world. And when people like Isaiah or people like you and me say, somebody ought to do something, God is saying, I'm here. Who will go on my behalf? So when you get up from the table, you have no choice but to say, here am I. Send me. Let us pray. God, we thank you that we can come together when the weather is bad like today and be reminded that you are our source of being, our source of purpose, and the one who calls us to much more than we've been. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your transformation and for your call upon our lives. Lord, you've come to transform this world with your love, and we are here to say, Lord, send us. And as we do that, we pray for our neighbors, our friends and family. We pray for Norris Wilson, for Bev Richards' family on the loss of her father, for Betty Heishman, for Miss Sherry, for John Willingham. We pray for the family of Nancy Levi, for Jimmy Carroll, for Harold Madigan, for Ed Orndorff, for George Morris, for the family of Sheila Baker, for George Quarles, for the family of Ann Kellican, for Dick Harmison and Jessica Marlowe, for Denny Bromley, for the family of Sally Robinson, for the family of Mike Fries, for Alyssa Gardner Farquhar, for Jeffrey Kuhn, for Alita O'Neill, and for Elliot Staines, and for others whom we name in our hearts. And we pray for our nation's troops and for their families. We pray for peace. We pray for our communities homeless and for those without work. We pray for those who suffer from floods and other natural disasters. 
And we pray, O oh God, for Braddock Street United Methodist Church that we might hear your call, that we might be inspired to be the body of Christ in our community. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.